Let's get started again with our second speaker, uh, also from Google, uh, DeepMind, uh, Carol Drecker. Hi. Uh, okay, so I will talk about the recent developments in generative models that sort of make them easy to train and make them scale and fit with neural networks. And then the very latest models, uh, very latest model, which we call the Recurrent Alternative Writer. Um, okay, so one, one of our goals is to understand data, right? There is a lot of structure in this data. For example, in, in images, you notice that nearby pixels are similar. There are a lot of curves in there, and there are objects, right? And you would like a neural network to discover such structure. You would like to build a neural network that can discover these things. That's one of the big goals of deep learning. And uh, the way you can imagine it is in the following way. So this is the picture which, can, which is inspired by the way the, the brain does it. So you have these levels of representation. And uh, this, it's, a, it's a deep brain is a, sort of a deep network. And uh, at, the, at the low level, close to beta, you have simple representations like edges. And as you go higher, and how you get more abstract representations. So we would like to discover, we would like to build a network that could do that. Now, and so far we haven't managed, uh, but I think there will be a good progress. So there is a hope. <laughs> um, so now let's consider what do we, how would we build such a network that can do that, right? So you know about neural networks, right? The basic neural networks. And uh, so let's just put some, let's just mention some criteria that this network will have to have, right? So. First, if you build some network, the hidden layers have to contain information about the input. Right? Obviously, they cannot just be constant. You have to assure that the information is represented in these layers. Right? So how you need to force that into the network. And you, you also don't just want these layers to be copies of the input. You would like the network to do something non-trivial with this information. And it would also be nice to generate. And Alex already motivated generation uh, for this, so um, I'm not going to say that again. Um, okay, so now let's go, let's go through this uh, step by step. How would we build it, it's sort of in a simple way? Okay? So one way to make sure that hidden layers, um, that the hidden layer represents input, is, is to ask it to reconstruct the input. Right? If I can get a good reconstruction, then, uh, uh, then I know the information is there. So you can imagine that you have this forward pass, you take an input and you pass it to this hidden layer, and if you ask it to reconstruct, and reconstruction is good, then it's represented there. And this is kind of the very standard autoencoder. Okay, so the autoencoder takes an input X, and it goes through neural networks, just like uh, the standard neural network, WX, TAN H. So these are just several layers until you come to reconstruction. And what do you, let's say, want to minimize is this is this objective x minus xr, right? So if this uh, value is small, then your reconstruction is good, and that's a cost function. Everything is differentiable, so you just back propagate. Uh, is that clear? Yeah. It's just a normal network which tries to reconstruct itself. All right. So now this way we can assure that you know the information is really represented in these hidden layers. Okay, now, but how do we make sure that the autoencoder actually does something non-trivial with this information? In principle, it could just copy it. Take the input, copy, 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 and you have perfect reconstruction, but you haven't really learned anything. Um, okay, so we're looking for some principle that we can apply, and one, one principle is just to find a simple explanation of data, which is kind of similar to saying find maximally, to maximally compress the data, right? If you, can, if you can compress the data, that means you are exploiting some structure. You found some structure in the data, and you can compress, like you notice certain things go together, so you don't have to represent them independently and things like that. So this is we take this as our goal, and you know we will see whether that works. Um, so now, how do we apply that in the autoencode? What we are going to do is that we are going to create a layer um, for which we restrict the information flow. We can say that there is only this much information in this layer, this many bits, and whatever comes comes out of it has at least that, or at most, that much information about the input. Okay. And in this case, the network will be forced to do something with the information, because it will try to reconstruct as well as it can, but can only use a small smaller amount of information. But actually, if we do something uh, better, we really are interested in compressing the entire data, not just restricting the flow. So what we are going to do is we are going to um, compress we are going to measure the information through this layer, 
And then given, given that information, we are going to produce something like a reconstruction. And if you want to call uh, your input, then what you need to do is you need to specify, you need to, you need to call the values of this hidden layer. And then given this layer, given the reconstruction, you need to specify how do we go from reconstruction to the input. Okay? So you, you call your hidden layer, and then you call it how much it takes to go from that uh, reconstruction to input. So basically, you can imagine that um, you know, if, the, if the layer doesn't transmit anything, then there is not much information in the reconstruction, and you have to call the input as if you were called, not doing anything more interesting, just directly coding it. Um, or, on the other hand, you can get some perfect reconstruction, but then you might cost you too much in the hidden layer. So the network is going to find some balance here. Okay. So in order to do this, mathematically, we need to sort of uh, explain how do we measure information. Okay. So um, consider a stream of variables uh, which can take n values. Each of these values, uh, each of these variables can take n values, and uh, the sequence can be compressed uh, if you find regularities in it. For example, if you notice that uh, the twos always come in a group of four, then what you can do is you can replace this group of four by a single two, and then that that completely preserves the information about the original sequence because you can transmit that and uh, recover the original sequence. Okay. Now, we would like to do this, of course, more generally, right, for any, any sort of sequence. And uh, an optimal way to do that is create a probability of predicting the next element of sequence from previous one. So you form this probability, just like Alex was talking about. Uh, you form this probability, and then you can show that you can compress the information to uh, this many bits given by this loss L here. That's the number of bits. And there is actually a practical algorithm to do this called uh, arithmetic coding, but we don't need to use it, we just want to measure the information. So you can sort of see that the better predictions you make, the closer the P is to 1. If you, if you correctly predict, the P will be 1, close to 1, and log of that P is close to 0, so it doesn't cost you many bits. On the other hand, if you didn't predict correctly, you, you, get, you assign prob low probability to what you wanted, then p would be very small, and then the log of p would be very large negative numbers, so minus of this large positive number. Um, okay, so this is how we can measure the information. And so now you can imagine putting that, that uh, measure of information into a layer, okay? So we can say, Let's create some predictor, so th there will be some values in this, la in this uh, hidden layer. And uh, we create some predictor of them, and th that is the number of bits that this information carry. Right? Um, and we can even do something simpler, and we can just imagine independent variables. We often just do that. So rather than considering it as a sequence, you just put a bunch of numbers and you compress them using these independent variables. Okay, so, so this is what we would do, right? So this layer that I'm talking about would look like this, right? So you, you take an input that produces some value here for this uh, neural network, and if, if, if what it produces is some binary sequence, some binary numbers, then you know that at, at most this many bits is transmitted through this layer, okay? And so now you can try to optimize the parameters and so similarly now, given that you have transmitted this information, you would like to get the reconstruction. And specifically, rather than think about the reconstruction, we simply provide the probability of input given the latent, ver given the latent variable. And then uh, the number of bits you would need in the input is this, is log of p of x given z. And so now we, what you would like to do is to optimize all the parameters so that the total number of bits is the smallest. Okay, so you would like to maximally compress this data. Now, the problem with that here a little bit is that um, this is a binary sequence, which is, uh, it's not smooth, it's not continuous, right? We need to do some thresholding or something to get this binary sequence. Uh, so instead, let's use real values, okay? So what we, are, what we are going to do is we are going to produce some variable, get the real values, and, and pass them through. Now, we would like to measure, um, you know, how many bits is passed through this layer. So what is it? So for the P of Z, for the continuous, let's say we can use unit Gaussian. Okay. Then how much, if I, if I produce some value of Z, how much information can I code? 
Well, if I just do this, a real value has infinite amount of information, right? Because it's continuum, you can stuff as much information as you want into, into the real number. So we need to do something to restrict that information. And the basic idea is to add noise. So, so what we are going to do is we are going to take the input and produce the mu and sigma of a Gaussian distribution. And then this layer is going to look like this. It's uh, it going to take the mu and sigma and produce the noisy version of this, of the variable z. So where this epsilon is just drawn from a unit Gaussian. So if you do that, then you cannot transmit infinite amount of information. Because think about, um, think about taking, taking two different inputs, right? If I would like to get, I would like to get really good reconstructions so that I don't pay bits in here, right? So if the inputs are very, if the inputs are very different, but I would map them to very similar values, right? Then I'm going to add noise, so I'm going to mess them up, right? So I'm, I'm unable to reconstruct two different values from z's which are very close. Because, some, because I'm adding noise, right? Sometimes I get this z, or sometimes I get this z, I get different z's. Right? So I cannot reconstruct. Um, so I cannot reconstruct two different inputs from z's which are very close. The z's has to be separated by at least the noise amount. Right? So the noise amount is sort of like this discretization, right? The noise amount that we had. Right? So you know the values of z are somewhere in the interval given by this Gaussian, let's say between minus two and two roughly, and uh, the weight of that Gaussian provides the discretization. It tells you how many how many different values you can encode in there. Okay, so, um, is, that, is that clear? Okay. So basically by adding this noise, we restrict the uh, amount of information passed through this layer. So that's just a picture. Oops. Okay, so now more generally, so this was for Gaussian distribution. Now, we, but we actually need to compute this L. What is that actual L? And, uh, in general, we can write this as, you know, we have this prior distribution, P of Z, and we have uh, this QZ, which is, which is this Gaussian, the one that uh, produced the noisy Z. Um, and then we would like to know, okay, what is the actual cost? Can we compute that? And the answer to that, which I, I will briefly explain how you get this, but I will also give you a different derivation of this. So if you don't get it, don't worry. You can, you can look it up. You can look up this paper. But basically, that is the formula. It, it's, it tells you, in Gaussian cases, roughly correspond the number of Gaussians that you can put uh, uh, in the unit interval. And uh, the way you do this is that what you imagine is, um, imagine you, this, you, you take the, value, the real values and you finally discretize them. And you transmit the trans. You finally discretize them, and normally it would cost you a lot of bits if you wanted to transmit that. But uh, we are having this noise, so rather than picking this noise independently, we call some other information into this noise. And then when we transmit the information, we transmit not only the information about the current sample, but also these extra bits. So the information about current sample is smaller. So that's kind of how the argument goes. But you should just remember that I will give you another derivation of this formula. But there is a specific formula that measures how much information is passed through a layer like this. And that, that's just the formula. It's just the log of ratio of these probabilities. Um, OK, so yeah. So what we have is, is a layer like this. The layer um, will take some parameter from here. Adds, adds noise, basically, samples from some distribution, and uh, gives you some cost of how many bits it, uh, it takes. Now, we need to backpropagate through this. And the way we can backpropagate is to just change the, just rewrite uh, what this layer does. You can write this layer in the following. So take the, oops, takes the input, take the input x, produce this mu and sigma, and then use the deterministic function, which is this one, uh, to, to get the noisy sample z. And now, this is just a deterministic function with some noise at it. So it's trivial to backpropagate for this. It's just a backpropagation to deterministic function. And you can treat the addition of noise as, as just some other input to this. Okay. So now we have a layer, which gives us the cost. And we can backpropagate through. 
So here is the summary of the entire algorithm. So the way the algorithm goes, you take the x, you compute the mu and sigma, um, you add noise, right? you produce the sample z, which gives you this cost in bits, then you reconstruct, or more precisely, produce probability of input given z, and the total coding cost is this lz plus lx. And uh, everything is differentiable, and, uh, and then what you are simply do is use backpropagation and stochastic gradient descent to optimize all the parameters. So, so can I have a question? How does this compare to the rest of the whole summation? Um, okay, I, I, will, I will explain that uh, in a moment, maybe. But in the rest, so maybe when I write it as a generative model, then I, I, can, I, I will answer the question. Okay. Just a moment. okay. And so this was introduced in these papers, a binary version in the first one and the Gaussian version of this in these other two papers. And um, okay, so now if you have a model like this, then we can generate easily from it. Um, we pick a sample z from this. So now we can drop this uh, upward pass. And what we take, we simply generate, uh, we simply sample z from probability p of z. Uh, then we cut. Then we calculate. Then we go down through the network, calculate p of x and sample. So it's very efficient. You just do a single pass through the network. Um, yeah. So now in the restricted Boltzmann machine, the difference is that here, this sort of model is called a directed graphical model. Uh, the way the probability distribution is defined is this way: is, is um, you know you, you generate a z distribution. You generate z from this distribution, and then x depends on the z. Whereas restrictive Boltzmann machine is undirected model. Um, so, uh, how, do, how do you sample from the distribution of z if you don't have any? Uh, it's just a uniform Gaussian. So this one is the it's a unit Gaussian. Okay. Yeah. So you just just sample from unit Gaussian. That's pure z. Yeah. So, yeah. Now there is different view of this, right? Um, so I, I like the compression view because you can sort of look at every layer and say this is how many bits it has. Right? But the other way to view this is forget about the upward model, the inference model. We just have this generative model. We define this generative model by saying, as, as I just mentioned, you sample from a P of Z, and then you go down and produce probability of inputs. And your goal is to simply maximize likelihood of the data. Um, you would like the px distribution to match your data distribution, and these sort of problems. This has been this is hard to solve because uh, in the solution of this, you usually need to find the probability of z given x, and that's very difficult. It's in general intractable. And so, what do we do instead? We produce some approximate posterior. So this q of z is supposed to be approximation of z given x of of p of z given x. And so you produce some other distribution that is supposed to approximate this process. And uh, what, do we, what we actually minimize is the, is the bound on this quantity. Okay. And you can derive this bound directly. Uh, so here is a derivation. I don't know if I should go through math here or not. But it's basically you write the log of p of x, you introduce a distribution. Uh, so this, this works now for any distribution, and then you follow a math. And you found out that this cost is bounded by um, this cost equals to this, and this is the coding. Oops, this is the coding cost I have been talking about before, and this is the KL divergence between the approximate posterior and true posterior. Ah, sorry, the, here the H is uh, supposed to be Z. Um, so you know you can derive it directly. You can directly derive this. Uh, Um, so now let me show you some results from these models. And so the very common data set that people use uh, is MNIST, which are handwritten digits. So uh, on the left you have a binarized MNIST. So these are uh, yeah, they are 20 by 28 essentially binary pictures once you binarize. And then on the right are samples from this Gaussian generality model. So the way you get these samples is, is, is very simple. You just pick, you just sample from this Gaussian, 
and then you go down to the network. Okay, so basically different real value in this gas and will produce a different picture uh, in here. And uh, so these are some results of uh, on some other data set. So now on faces it works pretty well. The faces are relatively easy generally, and then uh, images are quite hard. And I think you can do better now. There, you know, you scale it up and it works better. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is this is one way of, of doing that. Here are some samples from similar models. So this is from binary model, which has this autoregressive prior on the hidden layer, where the P of Z is not just the uniform Gaussian, or in this case, uniform binary distribution, but only distribution, but it's this autoregressive one where you predict one value of Z from previous ones. And these are samples from that. Uh, so they look pretty realistic. Um, you can hardly tell a difference between uh, the real one and, and uh, samples. And here are also some pictures from Atari games. So uh, Alex already showed you videos for uh, videos, and these are just static images. Uh, so on the left you have uh, actual, so these are five, five different games, and on the left you have uh, samples, and on the right you have nearest neighbor examples. And um, yeah, so, so it gets things like the objects in there, and it gets things like scores. So for example, look, it can produce different scores in these games. There's like a 15 here, and 35, and five. And sometimes it makes it makes a mess like that, but it can also produce a you know, different uh, number of the space invaders uh, in here. Now what it had difficulty was when there are different objects, when, when there are objects that can move around and they can be in many configurations. I think it's just a matter of scaling this and training it longer. But for example, you know you can see in this game sequence there is supposed to be like a submarine and fish. Um, so maybe with more training it would get better results in here. And then what Alex was talking about was basically this sort of network where this LSTM uh, feeds into this latent representation, into this Z in there. So it, it predicts in this, in this space. Um, yeah. So, okay, so what you can take from this is that we have this nice uh, layer here, right? We, um, that measures information. And you know, the no nice thing about neural networks is in the normal fit for case, like a classification, it can be arbitrary architectures and it's very easy to train, or at least very easy to code, right? Because it's just, you back propagate through for everything. You can make any graph and, and it's just, you just play around with different architectures. Now, and basically what we can do is the same thing but with generative models. All you need to do is you need to insert a bunch of these layers. These are the information carrying layers. And the thing that you have to make sure is that, <coughs> that there is no path that goes directly from x to p of x given z. All of the path, all of the information has to go through these layers. All of the paths have to go through these layers. Other than that, you can build any architecture you want. So, for example, here's just like a some some jumble um, in here, right? So. Um, you can connect it arbitrarily where you want to get the input. But for example, this is invalid because it goes. Th there is a path from input to this reconstruction. But other than that, it's it's the same, right? And the and the total amount of information is you just sum information in all these layers. And if you want to generate from them, you again you just you generate from each of these layers according to that P of Z prior distribution and uh, you generate your picture. Okay, so, all right, so now we have this new framework which is easy to implement and easy to use. You can build arbitrary architectures. So we can ask uh, what sort of architectures should be built and what do we want from them? Um, so, so here are some motivations. So when we have a, when we want to build something complex like images, you probably need a sequential process. So for example, let's imagine we want to generate face, right? So you decide to generate the face and then you decide to generate what kind of eyes do you want to put there and what sort of shape of these eyes is supposed to be and all these little details. And this is sort of a sequential process by which you do that. Um, so you need some sort of deep, uh, deep network there that does that. Uh, 
The second thing is that when we imagine a scene, we don't usually imagine it's just in one shot. And as, as, as my friend Dan likes to say, you know, when you want to imagine a beach scene, you imagine a sand, and then you imagine a palm tree and an ocean and somebody playing a ball. Uh, you know, you imagine it, this in a sequence. And also, you might, you might imagine something rough. You know, I want to generate a red T-shirt and then say, oh, let's put some dots on, on this T-shirt or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you might want to refine it later. And when we do that as humans, right, we use the same neural network in each of these steps. Right? We have one brain, and it does the sequential process. Right? It, it imagines the sand, then imagines a palm tree, and imagines imagines a beach. Right? So what we would like to do is build certain certain computational core, uh, which, which just repeats and does this operation. Um, so for this, we introduced this architecture called Deep Recurrent Attentive Writers, draw, okay, because it draws stuff. Uh, and it's basically a sequential process with attention. So it is a, it is a certain computational core, okay, which decides what to read, what to compute, what to represent, and what to generate at every time step. Okay. And on the, in addition to this, we introduced uh, uh, attention, attention mechanism. So we as humans, we can look at this very explicit attention mechanism. We point our eyes somewhere, right? So now we look here, and now we look in here. And uh, just as uh, Alex was saying, these attention mechanisms are becoming very popular. And he had, he had one example of this sort of mechanism, and we have here there is one which is more appropriate for images. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you what it does. First, and then I will explain the algorithm. Okay, so, when it's reading, this is what it, this is how it's reading the digits. So the green square is where it's paying attention to. Okay, so that's the attention mechanism, and the sequential nature is well, the sequential nature here. Okay? So you see that it's sort of following the digit. So, um, and then it, it needs to do this reconstruction, just like in this autoencoders that I've been telling you. Okay? So this is how it does the reconstruction. It slowly reconstructs the input. <coughs> and once the model is trained, the model can then imagine. And it also imagine that, imagines that in a sequential process. So these are now imaginations from the model. Um, so you can see that you know it, it really generates nice digits. And uh, sometimes it even... Yeah, it has a certain pattern of writing, but you know it, it generates a large diversity of stuff. Uh, okay, so how does it work? So what I have been telling you so far about is this conventional variational autoencoder. Uh, I'm just going to redraw it a little bit. So what it does is take an input, goes through the network, produces that approximate posterior, then from which it samples to produce this noisy sample z and then it decodes to calculate the probability p of x given z, the reconstruction essentially. Okay, so this is the normal autoencoder, and this is that information carrying layer. So the draw architecture is the following. So it looks more complicated, but this is, this is unfolded in time, so this is the computational core here. So let, let, let me walk you through what it does. So it takes an input x, uh, and it reads this input somewhere. So it has this attention mechanism, and it decides to read. Now, where it decides to read depends on what happened in the past and the random decisions it had made in the past, okay, about where to look and stuff like that. So it reads this, and, and, and based on what it saw before. So it reads this, then it passes through a neural network, and in this case, a recurrent neural network, uh, specifically LSTM. Uh, and then it produces these approximate posteriors and sample from it, and then it goes to another network and decodes. And then what it does, it writes the result into the into an input. So there is this, as Alex says, there is this canvas, and it, it writes into this canvas, okay, at different places. And uh, once it's done writing, then it produces probability distribution over input. So you have seen the you have seen the videos, right? You have seen how the network was reading it, and then how it was writing it, and then during generation, you need you don't need this bottom part. You just sample here from the prior distribution, and you go through this process to write the entire image. Um, and these are the information carrying layers. So you see that the process is valid because there is no direct path from input to the to the probability of x given the z. There is no direct path here. So, we can have this path, but we cannot have path which could go like this. 
from here. Okay. Um, yeah. So during generation, it basically makes decisions here. When it's generating, it starts somewhere and decides, okay, I'm to going to generate this picture here, and then I'm going to move here, and then I'm going to move here and generate this, and so on. Um, so, so this the first the simple way to implement this architecture is for, first without attention. Uh, so when these read and write operations are just matrices, you're looking at the entire image, okay? and this is what you get. Uh, so. In this case, the network first generates a blurry version of an input, and then it refines it and makes it sharper. Um, and with the attention is what I showed you before. OK, so now how do we do attention? Um, so in the attention, we specify where we are going to read, at which location, x, y location, and then how big the window we are going to read, and how blurry we are going to read that. So here on the right, we have examples of that. So here we are reading from window that is this large. And the blurriness is given by the width of this green square, um, yeah, the thickness of it. And so from here, you read you know, this little square like this. And here, it basically it reads the entire digit, but it does essentially subsampling. Um, it, it's very sharp. And here, it reads a blurry version of it. So, uh, for example, so what you get is you take a picture like this, and from this little region, you read a little square. So after reading, you obtain this sort of square. Okay? You obtain some low-dimensional, blurry version, version some, some low, smaller patch of the original one. And then during writing, you decide where you are going to write, and with what blurriness you are going to write. Uh, and you are going to take this and write it into the input. And you know, then you write it at all these different places, and that composes the, the image, the scene. Um, and this this mechanism is differentiable. Um, so, so now that you, I show you the algorithm, now you can see again what it is doing. You know, it's it's, it's reading it. Um, this was square. This was the writing, and this was generation. Oh yeah, sometimes you can see this cool, uh, like this digit four. You know, it reads this way, and then it jumps. And where's the other side of the... And um, the way these models are compared is how well they explain data, how good their likelihood is, which corresponds to how well we have compressed this data. And these are different methods in here. And the left column is, um, is the actual likelihood, and the right column is the variational bound, or the coding cost that I've been talking about. And these are like the Bolson machine and different algorithms. And this is the Gaussian model. And uh, this is um, this autoregressive binary model. And, uh, oops. and uh, the, the draw does basically, especially if the attention does a lot better than others. So it, it's not just that it looks pretty, it actually works quite well uh, in America. And then we did some more, more other fun experiments. So we put two digits on 60 by 60 background. So this is like a mini scene, right? You have two different things. And, um, and these are generated data from, uh, from this. And these are generations. So what it does, it, it, in each of these pictures, it produces one digit, and then it produces another one, right? So you can see it produces 0, and it produces 3. Right? So this, is, this goes towards the sort of scene construction, right? except it's much simpler than real images. Real images are quite hard. And then these are street view house numbers. Uh, so now there is a lot more diversity than in, in this MNIST handwritten digits. You have, different, uh, you have different colors, you have different shapes, different number of digits, and different sizes, and different slopes un under which they are written. And these are generated data. Okay. So except for the right column, except for this column, which are like the nearest examples to this, uh, these are generated data. So it manages to produce all this diversity um, in, in there. And this is the generation process. So, um, so you see, like, if the digits are smaller, it makes the window smaller, uh, like in here. And you can produce different slopes and different shapes. And then the real images there are quite diverse. And this is. This is the example from the real images. So these are generated data in this big square. And um, 
And so the training set is quite small, it's only 60,000 images, and there is a huge diversity of real images. Uh, so, you know, if you really see a perfectly generated data in this data set, you are probably just remembering what was in your training set. Um, so, you know, this generates some art, basically. So I will just stop it. I just stop with this one. Thank you, Charles. We actually have time for questions, so if there's any bit you would like to have to change this would be the, the right time to ask. This, by the way, it's amazing. I mean, that you have a neural network just generating stuff that looks like this, uh, this thing is just unbelievable. Is there a particular reason it's going right to left? Yeah, I just found a certain program, you know, doing it, and it just does it this way, yeah. I mean, it, it should either go from right to left or left to right because that's how the digits are written. I'm not sure which. Maybe if you run it again. Usually, when you train it, you know, do several runs, it will, it will find a different styles of writing style. It isn't endless. Um, yeah. Is there? Is there a question? Yeah. The what? What no? So what do you mean you want to put prior on the image? So we have this distribution of P of image given the hidden layer, right? Yeah. Now that distribution right now we are not using very good one. We are pretending that this is a binary data in this particular case. Uh, and we are using the same functional form. But you know, we are trying other ones. It's just a technical issue, sort of modeling the variance of it that you can, you can you get us there. Right? So. Ah, you mean di directly going over the pixels? Yeah, prior on the pixels. Okay, so I'm not sure whether that's what you mean, but uh, what you can do, instead of going to this latent layer, you can organize pixels in a sequence and predict them one after another from previous ones. And there are models like this. The basic one is called NADE, a Neural Auto Regressive Distribution Estimator. And they actually work quite well. Not as well as this, though. Um, now, so it's interesting that it works. Now, but it's hard to scale it to deep architectures because it becomes slow. Of the generation process, because you know, each time you want to sample a new pixel, you have to run through the entire network, and then run through the entire network, and run through the entire network. Another thing which is not satisfying about that is that each time you sample something, you are making a decision. Right? So if you do this latent space, and imagine that we achieve our goals of really creating this abstract representation at high level, then the way the network generates, each time it makes a decision at this latent layer, it decides, it would decide I'm generating a car or I'm generating face and then I'm going to generate these details. Whereas if you go pixel by pixel, it, it's making a funny decision. It's making, you know, am I going to make this pixel zero or one or some value? And then based on this, I make another decision. So these decisions don't correspond to these abstract decisions that we sort of think of we should, we should be able to get. So I think, I think uh, this building these latent models is better uh, for that reason. Yeah, uh, you um, you mentioned when you were mentioning certain layers which are now which restrict the amount of information flow between your sort of upward and your downward uh, parts of it. You said certain things weren't allowed. You weren't allowed a direct path. Yeah, I'm sure that picture. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. And the red arrow was that a, was that just a direct path there, or was that? Yeah, it was a that was direct path. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's hard to for this video. It's almost there. Yeah. So this this path doesn't go. You take the input and it goes into here without going through any information layers. It just goes like this directly. But if I transfer information in different layers of the network, mm -hmm. would not each layer contain different, more more or less information about the overall picture? 
or do they contain do they, do they contain the same amount of information? No, the information is distributed through the layers. So each layer has some now you can actually there's a nice thing. The reason why I went through this explanation that you can sort of imagine number of bits in each layer. Okay. The total information about the input is distributed through these layers and it's the sum over all of all of these information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you said uh, do you have an estimate like how much information is actually transmitted between these layers, like how many bits? Yeah, the, the cost, the L in here, that's, that's the amount of information that is in that layer. Yeah, like, but concretely for your cipher data set, like, how much information is, is, is used for the generative process if you are passing into that, the that, That's a good question, yeah, for like, you mean specifically what's the ratio between input and the yes. hidden, right? I think in like the standard one is roughly like on MNIST. Depends on data set. It's like half half I think, roughly. Depends what you do. Yeah. But they, they are comparable. Yeah. I was wondering if you have um, if there's any specific reason why the attention squares are almost adjacent to each other at each time step. Oh, why, why it doesn't jump around? Yeah, I guess it's found that it's a simple way of doing it. Um, yeah. Because maybe it's hard to jump precisely at some place. You know? If you are in here and then jump somewhere, it's probably not going to be anything there. You know, so. But you know, depends how depends on the RAM. Sometimes it has a funny way of writing. You know, like you write something and then it jumps and writes from somewhere else. So sometimes it does this jumpy behavior. But it just, yeah, depends what it finds. I think it's just, it would be hard to generate with pure lot of jumping because you jump somewhere it's not to expect. You know, once you see something in here, right, then you know there is where the stuff around it still is. Whereas you don't know where on the other side of the image there is information. I think that's kind of easy. Yeah, I should add that I've been doing research in this area for, God, very long, several, a decade or so. And many, many very bright people have tried to generate digits as well as this. They have all failed in comparison. Whether they've been using variational priors, uh, sparse coding, different types of Boltzmann machines, and the list goes on. Uh, nothing as good as this. Like when, when I first saw these digits, especially the street view, the Google uh, Street View images being generated, being dreamt by a model. And dreams is really the stuff, it's, it, it's dreams and regrets is the stuff of intelligence. If you can dream, you can think of what to do, you can plan and so on. And through regrets, you can understand, what if I had done it differently? And then you can, based on that, like uh, understand the causality of what's going on in the world and make your plans. So this is an amazing step toward uh, uh, understanding of intelligence. And uh, I'm really happy that Carol could come here today and give this talk um, at Oxford. Thank you. And next week we're doing reinforcement learning. You've heard about it today as the alternative way of doing things. Uh, so we'll go into reinforcement learning. Um, there was a nice article in uh, the front page of Nature last week uh, about some of the things we're going to cover.